All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, sorry we're getting started late here. I appreciate um, you coming out to look at open uh, source monitoring for OpenStack. This is uh, Saved by the Bell, uh, monitoring OpenStack with open source tools. My name is Jason Grimm. I'm an open, open cloud architect at Rackspace. Um, I'm joined uh, here by James Thorne and Vincent Rogers, two of my peers. We're going to kind of skip introductions and get moving kind of quickly so we can get to the content that we want to look at. Um, so we're going to go through uh, systems management background. We're going to look at OpenStack uh, monitoring from an overview perspective, and then we're going to dig in uh, with some walkthroughs on how to actually uh, do this from a technical perspective. So uh, about the presentation, we work for Rackspace, but this is not a sales pitch. Um, if you have been attending the marketing uh, talks, this is not that. Um, so uh, the, the send questions in real time, we're going to skip that. Um, my contact info is there. If there's any questions you have, just send them to me, and I'll answer them after uh, the summit. And uh, everything in here is 100% uh, open source. There's no proprietary anything. I'll skip this, too. Uh, it's some icebreaker uh, useless trivia around say by the Bell. Um, it's, it's not boxing. It's not classroom. It's not a bad TV show. It actually, uh, people would be buried with the bell in the, in the coffin in case they woke up uh, and were buried alive. So, I mean, the analogy there is that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're open stack environment, isn't uh, monitored. If you don't have the bells, uh, you may not be dead, but uh, you may be on computerjobs.com. So, um, so monitoring uh, in general is a component of a larger uh, operational management model. Um, I think all of us here that are in infrastructure management um, know that monitoring comes along with a suite of other activities. Um, like logging and alerting and uh, performance management, provisioning and triggering. Um, so you've got your data center infrastructure management at the bottom all the way up through your web and presentation tiers and access tiers. I wanted to start with this because we start to look at how some of this changes from a monitoring OpenStack uh, perspective. So on the far left, you have kind of the traditional physical uh, model, right? You've got the physical operating system. You've got your infrastructure support tier apps, um, database app or application tier, web tier, and, and access tier. Um, with the virtualization adoption, we're you know what got slid into that stack was a hypervisor and a guest operating system. So now there's you know two more components or or areas that you have to monitor, uh, manage, and uh, take care of. So cloud, I mean, I don't know what the you know, vernacular is, but cloud, what I'm calling cloud v1 here is kind of where we're at today, um, where we now have added a, a cloud operating system. Um, and that cloud operating system has a closer tie to the physical operating system and the physical devices. So now that line, so that area in red there, more and more becomes what we have to be responsible for. Because there's a, there's a the, the, the line is blurred between um, you know, what our cloud operating system is and what it's actually doing to the hardware. Um, so some of those roles and, and responsibilities are, are merging. Um, cloud V2, I don't know that the whole stack is going to be red, but w we see some very interesting things where stuff is moving down the stack and coming closer to the cloud operating system um, tier, and a lot of interesting discussions on what is platform as a service and, and what is, uh, who's responsible for what layer and should you be doing this here and should you not be doing this here. Um, one call out here I think that's interesting is guest operating system um, right today, not everyone is to that point of making a completely agnostic throwaway uh, designed to fail uh, guest operating system image. Um, you know, if you're, if you get to cloud, you know, if you get down this track and you're still trying to monitor the guest operating system and care and feed for it and know where it is and all that stuff, uh, then you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, so that's going to drop. Other, there's all these things that come in. The guest OS is one of the things that, you know, is going out. Um, this is another, you know, view at where OpenStack, you know, fits in the stack. Uh, and uh, where uh, PADS is and where, and where software is. So, 
you know, it's, it's strong in orchestration, extrapolation, API control, scalable, it's open. What is, what is um, lacking, or, or I'd say de-emphasized, is operationalized. Um, the the uh, logging and metering and management monitoring and all that stuff that it pushes outside, and we'll take a look at why it does that, right? So one of my first questions uh, coming into OpenStack two years ago was this very question, like where, uh, where is my monitoring uh, functions? Where can I see my alerts? Where can I see um, the stuff that I, you know, my graphing? And where can I see the performance metrics and all this stuff? Um, and it took me a while to get it that I was kind of you know, saying it could do all this stuff, and then people said, well, it's not designed to do that. And then I would say, well, why is it not designed to do that? It, it should do it. Uh, now I understand that it's got an intentional narrow focus on infrastructure as a service, uh, services. Uh, what that means is that there's an assumption that if you're deploying OpenStack, your environment already has tools in place to, mo to monitor your other Linux servers. Those tools, by and large, work pretty well for monitoring OpenStack as well, with, some, with you know, a few tweaks. Um, so existing Linux tool sets work. Most shops already have tools. Um, there's no reason to rebundle a tool set or recreate, and at the same time, there's no limitations or lock-in uh, on how you want to monitor um, your, your environment. So it's kind of like bring your own yeah, mentality, right? As a, as a other benefit there, there's, there's less bloat in the software, there's less points of failure. Um, you know, the open API um, is there for non-core functions like monitoring and a reduction of complexity and increase in efficiency. Um, again, though, it is, you know, monitoring OpenStack, it, or monitoring period, is one, one part uh, of a suite of things that you need to do. Whatever you're doing for your Linux servers today, uh, from a logging and reporting and um, uh, patching and updating, you know, Burra config management is going to have to be done in OpenStack and at, at a bare minimum and maybe a little bit more. Metering becomes more and more important if you're, um, you know, if you're an internal enterprise deploying OpenStack, you may not care immediately about chargeback and showback. Your service providers um, are in the old days even in uh, just traditional hypervisor days, uh, metering and chargeback and showback was kind of a, a holy grail that people were going to. It's still there in OpenStack, um, so you're gonna have to get better at that part of it. Um, so here's an example of if, you deploy, if, you're do, if you're deploying OpenStack and you don't know where to start with some default um, settings, This is actually taken, well, I said it's not a sales pitch, but this is what we use uh, internally. This is what I got out of our own documentation um, for monitoring OpenStack, at least the, the, the threshold. So you've got your hardware, typical stuff, uh, you know, CPU idle, disk space utilization. Like I said, this is gonna look pretty familiar to anything um, th that you're gonna do on, on, your, on your other Linux servers. So this slide is an eyesore. I'll get a better one. It's just in there for reference uh, content, but it's all the services that you want to monitor. And here's a, a view of the services broken up um, kind of functionally around what, what they do. So if you're, if you, I think I've got a better uh, picture. This isn't listing all of them, but if you're new to OpenStack, there is, uh, you know, different services run on different nodes. The controller nodes are going to be running your API endpoints and uh, your SQL instances and your MQ um, and, and things like that. So you're going to have to have a policy and an approach to monitoring uh, that device, and you're going to have a different set of services that are on the, on the compute nodes. Um, no. Sorry, I was trying to see how much time we had left. Um, so for hardware monitoring, you can roll your own, but you probably already have a tool uh, in place. If you don't, here's some free, um, right? You've got free like beer, which is free, uh, but not open. Uh, and you've got free like speech, uh, which is free and open source. Um, Nagios and um, 
some of the other, and graphite and some of the other tools that we're going to talk about. We'll do hardware monitoring as well. Uh, I didn't put that on here, but um, from a hardware monitoring perspective, it's almost easier to uh, get a kit than, than doing it yourself. Um, so from a software monitoring standpoint, these are popular suites. Uh, Nagios, um, probably the most prevalent. Uh, that's not a statement of quality, um, although in many people's opinion, it is a statement of quality. It's a, it's a statement of, uh, of consistency. It's been around since 1999, and tons of people are already using it for Linux monitoring, and therefore are also doing it for OpenStack monitoring. So along with, the, along with Nagios, there's a commonly uh, a accompanying tool set um, for log management, for uh, alerting, and for uh, metering and graphing and reporting. These are some of those tools. So let me get through that. So the first view that I wanted to look at is uh, a, a do-it-yourself uh, view. And it's not, a, it's not a suggestion that you should you know, do everything by hand, but it takes us through um, how it can be done very easily in a, in a very short period of time and what are just a couple of things, uh, what are we looking to monitor and, and how do we do it? So um, I'm doing this on, well, I got it written right there, right? This is, I did it on, on CentOS. It's exactly the same for Ubuntu with, with the package name change. Um, so we install a couple of tools. We install a couple of OpenStack-like services, right, to Rabbit and SQL and Libvirt. And uh, we just cat literally, you know, 15 lines maybe uh, into a shell script in user bin, set some variables, set an array for our services, uh, set up a log, and set up an email alert um, to, to send out to us in, in the event of an issue. Um, we add that to cron and you're you're done that's pretty much it you you you've now you're now monitoring openstack um, let me show you the results here so that that script is monitoring you know libvirt and http and rabbitmq and mysql's on there too i mean with that few lines of code we're getting uh, an email alert we're logging to csv uh, we've got command line logging as well. Um, it really doesn't take much uh, to, to get your environment monitored. Um, not just monitored, but we've got logging and scheduling and, and reporting and email alerting as well. Um, you could take that. I mean, if you like that approach or you're already kind of a do-it-yourself shop anyway, um, you can enhance that a little bit by when you do the right uh, to the log, out, um, you know, do it with HTML tags. Um, you could, instead of just checking that, that last screen, um, just checked if the process was running. It just did a PS and a grep on, on the process. Um, that's great, except the process can hang and still show in PS but be dead. So probably a better approach is to actually ask MySQL um, to show databases or something like that. You're actually asking for the health of the system, the same with Apache, uh, or an OpenStack service in that case. So um, you could have a, a, tra a trap, for lack of a better term, to go and do a Nova list. And if Nova list dies, um, then you know consider that down. Um, it gets a little bit muddier because Nova list is hitting a whole bunch of different things, right? It's hitting SQL and it's hitting Nova and it's uh, you know, hitting multiple components, so you'd have to dig in and tune that down to, to just what's needed. So we're going to look at Nagios. Uh, like I said, it's been around since 90, 1999. The OpenStack Operations Guide uh, itself says, you know, Nagios is a tried and true um, systems administration staple. Um, I would agree with that statement, and I, I like Nagios and uh, most of the Integrators and repackagers are, are using Nagios, and uh, again, it's not a quality, or it's not a statement of quality. It's just that's you know it works, right? So um, this installation is uh, CentOS 6.5, uh, Nag Nagios Core 406, Nagios Plugins 201, <clears throat> and the 
So the first thing I do on any box, if it's a net new box, is, is update and upgrade and reboot to make if there's any kernel modules. I make sure everything comes up clean. Um, and I probably should have put snapshot in here if it's a VM. But uh, then we install just a few dependency packages, um, you know, Git and OpenSSL and Make and some of the common things. Uh, 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 one other thing to mention here is that we're not, it wouldn't be very interesting to um, show you me just downloading a Nagios VM appliance and you know doing or, or downloading a kit to deploy Nagios so that's is all from source uh, what we're going to do. So uh, you create your users and groups, passwords and, and membership. Uh, download and extract the tarball for Nagios, the plugins, and uh, NRPE is the Nagios remote plugin and um, executor. It's um, it's a client server agent framework, uh, for lack of a better term, that sits on the remote machine ready to execute uh, things like uh, checks uh, against it. So um, configure Nagios uh, from a, if you haven't downloaded from source, uh, it's not configuring like adding things to text files, it's, it's configuring the um, the tarball and getting uh, ready to make uh, uh, executables out of it. Make and install. That was interesting. Um, sorry, I can deploy OpenStack, but uh, PowerPoint and two screens uh, escapes me. So. Um, so add a contact. Um, the, and so now we are into the Nagios uh, configuration um, portion of it. So the, the Nagios bits have been installed, but they're sitting there kind of, uh, you know, unconfigured and idle. So um, we make and install the uh, webconf, which is the, the front end. Um, with a couple of switches about what we called the user and what we called the group. Um, do some uh, change ownership on the, on the directories. Uh, the NRPE is actually the more difficult uh, piece to configure. So the remote plugin executor, I don't know the history of it, I just know it's a pain um, Every time I every time I go to install it, because it's an XINet service, and you've got to manually add it uh, to services. Here's you know if you're doing it yourself, um, you may want to use the distribution, uh, so if it's a CentOS or uh, a RHEL or a Fedora, you may want to use the, the 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 packages from your operating system uh, distribution for that, uh, but. If you have to do it by hand, you create you create an XNetD service and put your you know allowed and your users and groups, your port and and all that for that. Um, we add it to services again by hand. Um, we go into an RPE dot, uh, config and, and you know uh, the only thing we have to change in there is what host can access it. And the netstat, I didn't show the outputs of it, but uh, just a couple of can commands to make sure it's running. Even though I've done this uh, uh, several times in the past, this portion and the, and I, and the net stack commands I put in there because it took several tries because, you know, IP tables was, um, I had to configure or something, you know, XINet I had to restart or I had to install XINet and things like that. So, it, it, again, going back to the, Using the packages from your OS, if you went and installed an RPE, a Nagios dash plugins dash an RPE, it would install XINetD for you and get it started. So, in that case, going by hand is it might be kind of slow. So we verify uh, Nagios and we, you know, set HTTP uh, and Nagios to uh, run levels, and we start everything up. If you, if you know, assuming everything worked. Well, this is the screen you should see. Um, again, it's not uh, it's not sexy, but it is consistent and reliable and stable, and it's open and it's pluggable, and it works um, every time. So, unless you're installing an RPE, <laughs> it takes a few times. Um, oh no! 
Okay. So on the node to be monitored, I just going through here real quick. The easiest way to get that up is uh, is a dev, dev stack build. Um, the do-it-yourself stuff. I just installed OpenStack-like services, which is HTTP and MySQL and Rabbit and things like that. Um, now we're going into Nagios, and we're actually want to monitor more services. So just if you don't have an environment, uh, even if you do, throw a dev stack box um, up, which is uh, remarkably easy to do, right? You, you install Git, uh, you sync the, the, the repo and stack.sh. Um, on the Nagios side, you define the host that you want to, uh, to monitor, the, the remote host that is, and you add that host to the objects file Um, and then you, after you add the host, you have to tell Nagios to, it's, it's, a, it's an include kind of behavior, just like uh, Apache or some of the other services that um, when you're loading, go ahead and include these config files as well. You can put everything in the same config file, uh, but when you get to, you know, when you get north of 10 hosts and everything in the same config file, uh, it, it's gonna get messy and troubleshooting that and, and chance for error uh, becomes greater. So break out your host into separate files. And in that file, you, you define the host, then you have to define every service underneath it. So if I want to monitor Nova or SQL or MQ or Cinder or any of those, it's a, you know, it's a, a stanza-like configuration for each of those. So uh, if you do go the single file route, um, 10 hosts with 10 services each becomes 100 um, stanzas, which is you know several pages of config file that you don't want to go to, so break them out. Um, after that's in, uh, restart, restart Nag Nagios. And what you, you know, now here's my host in Nagios, and I've got uh, my checks, you know, for, for my services, and that's pretty much as, as simple as it gets. That's it. Yeah, so questions? No? Um, you can email me, jason.grim at rackspace.com. Uh, I can answer questions. Uh, after the summit, I'm happy to do that. Um, oh, go ahead. Have you done any work with integrating anything from Solometer into Nagios in terms of monitoring your guest VMs to alert when either thresholds are met versus the standard, just using NRPE, but using like Solometer or any of the other built-in telemetry data? That's a great question, and I'm gonna defer to these guys because I actually don't know that. I wish I had thought of that when I <laughs> signed up for this because that's an excellent that's an excellent question. Do you guys know? Um, I haven't personally done anything with it. Um, for example, within Rackspace Private Cloud, um, Solometer, we're not really ready for it yet, and we wouldn't want to rely on its data to do any sort of alerting yet. That could obviously change. Um, but yeah, I mean, Nagios is extremely extensible and customizable, so you could write whatever you want to do that. But unfortunately, I. Haven't done it, so sorry. <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, I guess we'll just call it then. Thanks, everybody.